things. And so the question is this, why is it now that there's a call it vastly more popular sense of the end of times? Mm -hmm. The vastly more popular sense of bad things are happening Imminent in a big doom. way. Imminent doom, right? And the short answer is, is because the, the, the envelope in which we've been held, the, I, I will call it the civilization structure, mm -hmm. the, the institutions that we've been in, they are in fact actually dying. Yes. Right. So there is, there is a moment that this phrase of like, allow the dead word to be Good. burned off. I'm glad you're saying this because I, I heard an interview with you and it sounded like you were agreeing with the interviewer's proposition that climate change was the thing or something that like we have, it was, you were talking about why Game of Thrones is so popular and is such a great sort of allegory for what's going on, uh, right? And you've oh, got the White Walkers, and she was talking yeah. about uh, climate change being an allegory for the White Walkers and this incoming thing. And I was thinking, well, yeah, there is that, but the major thing is the truth is that the system, th those aspects of the system are dying. Right. The old media is dying, the old politics is dying. Those things are the things that are, are dying. Yeah, yeah, sure. And the archetype, the, the, the archetype of, of the, the White Walkers is not climate change. The archetype of the White Walkers is when civilization falls, things get uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. and it's not a good thing. We don't yes. like it when that happens. Those right. things are collapsing. There so, is a fucking great doom going right. on. And that's that's Those really things happening. Are right? yeah. So, you know, if, if, if you're, as an individual human, um, a, as you grow up, right, the, what is it, it's time to leave behind childish things. Well, from the point of view of the childish things, what that means is it's time to die. Mm -hmm. right? From the point of view of the self that is continuing to go on, it's the time to grow up. Yeah. Right? That's just always happening. That's just what it means. For change to occur, some things literally just die. They go away forever into nihil. Yeah. Well, in this case, what's happening right now is that gigantic chunks of, the, of what we have thought of as kind of being the world. We've had this weird model that the notion that when you're six, you go to kindergarten, then you kind of toil through primary school, and then you go to high school, and then you go to college, and then you get a job is the world. <laughs> right? And it's not. And that's going away. Right? And so what's happening is that people are perceiving, because it's becoming increasingly obvious, that all of these artifacts of the way that we've gone about doing civilization in all the different ways, like pick your poison, it doesn't really matter because they're all kind of tied together, yeah. um, are breaking down and failing in a way that is no longer easy to pretend isn't happening. And so as a consequence, this triggers a deep visceral sense. And that's a good thing, right? Because that deep visceral sense is the return to the liminal, the return to the mystery, the return to the, the state, which by the way invokes this conversation. Right? Human beings have encountered this problem before. Yes. We've, we've been in, living in the valley, yeah. right? We've had a situation where the, the drought has come and we need to leave. Well, how we deal with that is first and foremost, we drop the parts of us that wants to stay where we are. We allow the sadness of change to occur and we process that. We feel something bad has occurred. Danger has just emerged for sure. Like leaving the, the old fertile valley and migrating across the desert is fraught with danger and some of us may not make it. But at the same time, it activates in us as well the call to consciousness the call to gather together, the call to begin to actually become thinking in a group. And to adventure. And then into an adventure. This is a big fucking adventure. Find your heroes, yep. find your courage, yep. find your, your role, find who you are in this place and get deeply good at it. Find out how to build real relationships with the people around you of trust and have the power and binding and get across that desert no matter what happens, and then go. Yeah. And in this case, the other side is paradise. Or at least something really awesome. Yeah. Like, it may, I, I do not expect that it will in fact be a terminus and then end, I think it'll be more in the direction if we get to go to Mars. But it's a fucking God level. It's, another, it's a whole other level. That's right, that's right. Minus a whole load of the shit that we were just dealing with before because we thought that's just what the world was. And, yeah, it, and yeah. it won't be there anymore. That means, like we were saying earlier about each sort of level generation, less miserable crap to deal with. You have this huge space in which you can be mighty. Yeah, yeah, it's... Um... What is the metaphor for that? Well, we have a, we have a metaphor in biology. It is the transition from caterpillar to butterfly. Yeah, there you go. And it's the metamorphosis. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, which is the classic one. I was obsessed with that as a child. It's perfect. That's perfect. And that's yeah. it. That's what's happening. It's just butterfly season. In what I've seen of your stuff, you seem to lean more towards a uh, idea that we are doomed. <laughs> You mentioned this earlier. You tell that that story because that was quite funny. But you met with oh, two oh. guys. Oh no, no, these folks who are, who are experts in risk. Yes, they've been exactly. monitoring all the different forms of risk, and they yeah. were these are the world experts in say nuclear proliferation, the risk of nuclear war, yeah. or nuclear bombs going off, and then experts in um, like disease, global disease, yeah. particularly uh, people deliberately designing 
germ warfare and get it getting out. And then two or three more massive errors of risk. And, and each one of these individuals came up and they were all, and they were each speaking and each one, the theme was more or less the same, was we're fucked. You know, the, the, the approaches that we currently take, the institutions that we have to police these kinds of risks are barely holding on by their fingernails right now. And the problem is continuing to get worse, which is, it's kind of like the exact inverse of the advantages of decentralization. So we could talk about like the democratization of media in a very positive sense. And of course, I guess if you're currently in charge of mass media, it's negative, but for everybody else, it's mostly positive. Um, and we can even talk about like the democratization of genetic engineering in a positive sense. Like there's some really powerful stuff that comes out of it. But also there's a negative sense, which is that the things that used to be very rare and used to be easy to control because they were so rare, as they become widely available and still powerful, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing where until and unless we invent some new way of dealing with that, uh, if we're still trying to manage it with the old techniques, they are very, very dangerous. Hmm. Um, and one, I guess, the, for me, the, the, the real, the key insight is just, is just this. Um, up until, I think I may, we've talked about this before, but up until about 1947, human beings really couldn't fuck it up. I mean, disease could come and kill us, or you know, famine could wipe us out. But even if we warred like crazy, the World War II style war, just the tiniest blip in our population. Even the Bronze Age collapse, which took out like seven major civilizations, still effectively non, no effect at all on, on the human story. Um, but around 1948, when the U.S. and the Soviets both had H bombs, we started moving into the zone where we actually could fuck it up for everybody. Like we could kill everybody, and that's just a new state. Um, and of course, in 1948, that consciousness was a big deal. Like, oh, wow, this is, this is a big deal. We need to be very careful about it. And over the next 50 or so years, we got kind of okay at not getting everybody killed. But you remember, there were some dodgy moments there in the middle where it seemed like it might <clears throat> not work out. Um, but the problem was actually relatively small. Like, we literally, all we had to do was prevent, in this case, five or six people around the world who were pretty well known, like the leaders of nations and pretty well monitored, from pushing the button simultaneously. Yeah. Like even if just one of us pushed the button, we could probably still make it. So we had to think that's the problem. But as technology has gotten more powerful and more decentralized, you know, things like um, you know, cyber warfare is a simple example. Mm -hmm. Fifteen years ago, cyber warfare didn't matter that much. You know, who cares if a hacker shuts down um, the computing grid in a major city? But as things like our electric systems and our water systems and maybe even our automotive transportation systems are all on a computer grid, mm -hmm. one hacker, one unhappy hacker in one location could shut down an entire city and that could generate actual chaos. Like the cities are large and the ability to rebuild them might be very hard. And that's to say nothing of something like say CRISPR where that same group of kids, maybe 20 well-resourced PhDs could build a, a super gene uh, virus that could wipe out a billion people. Um, and, and that's unprecedented, right? And so what's happening is, is that the magnitude of the risk is now existential. We can now kill everybody. Mm -hmm. And the kinds of things that are in that magnitude are proliferating. And the difficulty of getting access to it is going down. So that arc is a very bad arc. Like that, yeah. that, that story ends badly. In, every, in, every, in every, uh, every way you tell it, it ends badly. Um, which is not, by the way, to say that We've it's... We've heard it told many times as well. That's true. Is the thing. Yeah, we have, we have heard it told many times. It's kind of the, the story we heard the most through like the 60s through to semi-recently. Right. Well, this is the consciousness of, of tapping into that deep, the deepest mythos of wait a minute, we have as humans, as a species, we have witness moments that at least to our local tribe were apocalyptic. Yeah. We've had situations where we all starved to death. Everyone spoke about the flood. We've all had a flood where something really seriously bad, something so bad happened that we still know about it 2,000, yeah. 5,000 years later. So we have that. And so nuclear war raised that energy. Yeah. Uh, and so the positive side of the story is we have that in us. We have in us the notion that that's a thing that happens. And we also have the notion of what the right answer is. We know how to respond to it, at least mythopoetically. Um, and I guess sort of your side of the story, which I, I, by the way, completely agree with and believe, and that's all I care about is focusing on going there, is that there's a mirror image. Yeah. That these same powers can be used for good. Yes. The difference, I think, right now is that up until recently, they could be used for good. Now they must be used for good. Yes, which is, which is an, kind of an, an imperative for us to transcend to the level we need to get to, to become the species that we could be, you need those kind of stakes mm -hmm. to force you mm. oh, I like that. in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. And in the old balance, no light without shadow, etc., no hero without the, the balanced vi villain, 
you need that motivation to be greater and to go further and to be a better version of yourself and you know a better version of all of us together because as you've talked about it takes all of us working way harder on making all of us way better together to be able to combat those things nice i like that so if you can imagine like taking these these forces these these places that we could go these poles um of heaven and hell right mm -hmm. these intense mo modes and then try to turn them into a tool as you say like as motivation that the the, the prospect that this hell is a thing that lies in our future unless, and this prospect of this thing human is a thing that lies in our future if. And if you can find a way to build in yourself the capacity to relate to it in that fashion, meaning allow the notion of the prospect of hell unless to be a motivator, yeah. not a demotivator. Yeah. Right? Which is what I do and have mm -hmm. been doing for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of, and it seems silly not to, right? Yes, because I agree. The, the opposite leads to, what does it lead to? Misery and tragedy and, and sorrow and, uh, and cancer and death. Well, this is the opposite is, is, is a joyful existence in which I look around you, look at this glorious shit that we exist in that couldn't have even been dreamed of by people a few generations previous. Yeah, it's astounding, isn't it? Like the, yeah. the, the amount of beauty and joy that we can witness yeah. just now, yeah. much less that we could witness yeah. is in fact actually astounding. It is the kind of thing that is only written about in like poetry and in mythology. Yeah. And it's actually yes. present, it's real. Yeah, this we is our day-to-day -day lifetime. And what I find particularly encouraging uh, is that someone starting from this position, like I have a five-year-old kid, I have a five-year-old boy called Hercules who plays Roblox and Minecraft and, like, and Lego. He plays Lego in the real world. He plays Roblox and Minecraft inside a computer. He has no limit to his imagination for creation. He sees no end point of where, where, where he can't sort of like create what's in his head and turn that into a thing. He lives in this like glorious paradise that his ancestors sort of sweated and died for him to get to the point of. And like the idea that that would all sort of collapse just at that point of triumph kind of seems silly. Like he and all of his little brothers and sisters and your kids who you were telling me a story about them all working together on this Minecraft project like some incredible fucking hive mind. Yeah. Uh, that's what will get us through these things. Mm -hmm. So this reminds me of the, the thing you were mentioning uh, outside, which was really interesting to me. I'd never heard it before. I think it's amazing is the, you said wholesomeness is the new punk. Yeah. And I love that. So I think this is the right bridge because that's yeah. the energy that you're talking about. I've been thinking a lot and talking a lot for a long time about these cultural sort of shifts. We swing on a pendulum every seven years between punk, nihilism and psychedelic sort of hippie optimism. Mm. And then that happens in a grander scale. The last time that swung, it was at the end of 2012, was the end of the last peak thing. And people were talking about staged alien invasions at the 2012 Olympics and things of that nature. And uh, then it all, then everyone sort of descended into complaining about you know, invasions of foreigners and, and things of that nature. We're going back into a psychedelic territory. Uh, the difference is in this time is we've been through many, many sort of generations of rebellion uh, against the old order. As it reminds me of a spit an image sketch about Madonna, sort of how much more naked could she get and then she pulls off all her skin. Mm. But it's like we've been through every kind of rebellion. The most rebellious thing you can do right now is take personal responsibility uh, commit to a person, raise a family with that person, uh, invest yourself fully in them being the best they can possibly be. Like wholesomeness is the most countercultural, rebellious thing you could do right now. Like wholesomeness, therefore, is the new punk rock. And what's dope about that is that uh, fixes loads of problems. Mm -hmm. If like on a mass sort of scale, everyone's going, okay, cool. The cool thing to do right now is to take personal responsibility and uh, invest the time and energy in making myself the best version of myself I can possibly be. If people are doing that en masse, you don't even know what, what the effects of that could be. So it's because it hasn't happened before. And because the internet is here, you have this on a mass scale. You have c cultural icons like uh, Ethan and Healer at H3 uh, about to have a child and be the first sort of uh, YouTube wholesome family. Mm -hmm. This is like, this is bigger than Mr. Rogers. This is way bigger than Mr. Rogers. Right? <laughs> this is, you're seeing this 
from the from the ground <laughs> up. You see, because these are two kind of like meme edge lords, kind yeah, of yeah. coming out of the counterculture, like growing up. And so we're in a place where the the um, like the the tyrannical, the rebellion against the tyrannical king. Mm -hmm. The tyrannical king is quite obviously not in charge in a deep way, right? There's a what was the phrase like Buddha died and it took a thousand years while his shadow was still being shown. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, sure, I get it. We can we can still sort of identify a simulacrum of a tyrannical king. And to be sure, there are still like powerful bad guys out there with with power. But the reality of the capacity of the people to just choose to enter into a new way of being is. Well, it's there. It is simply there. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing that I was thinking about is this concept of wholesomeness is so, is so powerful because there's way, two different ways you can go about making a good choice, like doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. One way is you can do the right thing because you've been told it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, that's hard. It sucks. It's fragile. Uh, you're almost like struggling against it. You know, it's like you eat your broccoli. Yeah. Um, and what's going to end up happening yeah. is eventually you're going to grow up and you're not going to eat your broccoli because the exactly. authority figure is not there telling you what to do. And you do the fucking opposite it's as terrible. much as you can. Right? Now, if you're actually f wholesome, you're eating your broccoli because it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And it's easy. It's just a natural thing. And so this builds up from the bottom. It's basically just building it on a solid foundation. Yeah. And you build it on the base. And so, okay, I'm going to take responsibility. And then I'm going to enter into a relationship with another human being where I'm going to take responsibility for the relationship. And, and, and with a human being who's taking responsibility for Mike herself. And then we're going to have a child together, yeah. responsibly. And we're going to take responsibility for that child, and we're going to start stepping out and taking more responsibility for the place where we live. And where the child might perhaps go to school or interact That's with right. the community. And, and, the and, and, not, and not with a, a sense of like powerlessness, yeah. and therefore with a sense of either like a, that um, lashing out edge of I'm powerless, and the only way I can express my anger at powerlessness is to lash out, yeah. but with the sense of, Okay, how do, we, how, what do, how do we do this? And how do we find other people with whom we collaborate and can coordinate, because we can, we can find them anywhere, um, who are, are willing to enter into honest relationships with us to build these things. Yeah. And everyone's on that same level. Everyone's parents divorced. Yeah. Nobody wants yeah, that yeah. life. No one wants to die alone in an old person's home. And with that, that's, so you, you can see that everywhere now. No one wants that. Yeah. That's the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. What, like, what, aside from, uh, nuclear annihilation is better than that. It is, actually. I completely agree. Yeah. Vastly better. Yeah. Yeah, that, that notion of being completely alienated from humanness yes. and dying in that context yeah. is abysmal. We've now witnessed that. We've seen that experiment. That happened. And I think you're right. I think there's a deep, visceral sense. I mean, honestly, I feel, um, how do I say this right? I feel a sense of, like, how can we actually help the baby boomers get across that threshold like how do yeah. we i know they've got to be absolutely terrified by the recognition that the world that, that they live in that they've helped build largely helped build is not one that they want to be actually truly old and die in no. um and yet you know it's not yet available we don't yet have the things in place to allow them to have a, a family and a community that is rich and can meet human beings even as they move into elderhood and then death but that is clearly the thing that needs to happen. And I think we can all perceive that all the way down to our, uh, you know, in, in the depths of our bones. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty dark. The, the sort of, the baby boomer thing of, oh, they ran around and like had all the drugs and had all the sex. And then we're like, right, no more of that for anyone else. <laughs> and now we're going to take over every industry possible. And we're actually not going to give up any of our jobs ever. And we're going to stay here and we're going to live till we're like 100 or da 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 da. The, the ending isn't so nice for them, actually. Yeah, that's it's like crazy. the Scarface thing. Yeah. People always forget the ending of Scarface where like, you know, his sister's like, you know, and he gets, he, she gets killed and it's his fault and he dies and stuff. People just think about like the fun bit of Scarface. But... That's right. Yeah. The ending of Scarface is not, uh, not a good no. way to go. That's a moral lesson. No, yeah. And the ending of the boomers, the potential ending of the boomers is the, is, is the saddest, is the saddest ending there is. And it's so interesting because it is actually just down to a choice. Like as individuals and as a group, they still have the capacity to change the story. So that's the superpower, is when you decide, because, yeah, you, the optimism thing or the, the wholesomeness thing, it's a, just a decision, and you decide it every day, and you act on it every day. Mm. And every day you go out and interact with the world, you could glare at someone or you could smile at them. Just the little, small, tiny things like that are the things that then ripple out and maneuver. And you have to be mindful all, all times because it's very easy to get distracted from that path and, yeah. 
and fall into a, a rage at something pointless or to, to uh, be brought down by a potential dark possibility or whatever it is. But it's, it's, a, it's a thing that requires much work and purpose. But purpose brings power. Without purpose, you're powerless, and then, then it's depressing, you feel like shit. But if you have purpose, that's a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. And if you go out and enact that in the world and continue to do that, then it, it, grows, it grows exponentially. Right. And, and everyone around you is doing it as well. There's a whole bunch of you doing it. Right. How do it gets easier and easier and more and more powerful. Yeah. It has the, 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 there's that characteristic that in the technology world they call a, uh, a positive feedback loop or an exponential, yes. uh, what's it called, network effect. Mm -hmm. And it happens in you first. Yeah. Right? You make, if you have the ability to just make one choice and then you can listen to the consequences of how that choice is better than the other choice. Yeah. And then as the basis of that, okay, I'll make some more in that vein that feel like that and go in that yeah. direction. Then you get more clarity on what that feels like to make those kinds of choices. And you get more courage because you have more hope that that actually lead to better And choices. you start to see things working and you're yeah. like, oh shit, that works. Maybe this will work. And then that does work. And then it becomes this, this practical real world thing. Mm. Kind of like I was saying earlier about the Minecraft generation just knowing certain things work. You know, the, the dank meme community knowing that chaos magic works. Right. Knowing, and so you know this stuff works. You know if you put it into practice you will have good results, you'll feel good, everyone around you will be good. It's just, a, and who would choose to, be, to, be, uh, to live in horror when you could live in glory and wonder? Mm. <laughs> this is a choice we're all making together right now. Yeah. Hey, yeah. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And this is where, before we forget this point, because we realized this earlier, and the, the exciting, and all these cultural things are very important. You know, what was his name? Andrew Breitbart would say that uh, politics is downstream from culture. I would mm -hmm. say that everything is downstream from culture. Absolutely. Culture eats strategy for lunch. Is the yeah. Other one. yeah. So therefore, it's important. And part of the whole story of this new Golden Dawn is that, like, the biggest thing in cinema is the Marvel Cinematic Universe and these gods reborn as archetypes rendered by our splendid technology in such a fashion that like we could never have really like imagined. Mm. Like people would have that, you know, you would imagine a thing, but this is king there, you can like touch it, you go and say, oh my God, look at this, he's fucking amazing, he's flying. <laughs> he's, not lying, he's not lying on an ironing board with a green screen, it's like, he's fucking flying, <laughs> right? And uh, Marvel have just bought back Fox, and everyone's like, ooh, we're getting the X-Men back. But also means they're getting back the Fantastic Four. And I was all excited because that means that that Kirby stuff, that which is really, really powerful, Jack Kirby, who was connected to the unconscious and the ether in a way that few humans ever have been. Yeah. Uh, certainly in our lifetimes. But what did you point out? <laughs> what happens when the Fantastic Four comes back into the Marvel Cinematic Universe? It's incredible, right? It's, it's that the, with like the X-Men, that we've, they have that whole story of, of what's called the punk rebellion, yes. of the marginalized and the atomized yes. and what that feels like. And with the Fantastic Four, it's a completely different feeling. It's a different era, right? It's that notion of wholesomeness. It's family. Oh, it's incredible. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny. I, I remember that, that <laughs> I, I, uh, for those people who grew up weaned on pop culture, as we did, um, I, I certainly have had the continuous experience of disappointment in our storytellers failing to deliver on the promise and, by the way, the obligation of being the ones who actually create the deep mythos that drive and orient our lives. Yeah. Um, George Lucas sort of being quite notable. Um, <laughs> and then I noticed that, that the, in, the, in the telling of the Fantastic Four stories that have shown up in Hollywood thus far, I felt sad. Yeah. And more sad than I would have thought I should have felt. Like, why, why do I feel sad about that? This revealed it. Yeah. Like, I actually remember as a kid sitting down or laying down and reading those comics, having a feeling of a connection to family, yeah. having a feeling of connection to a, a sense of, of human wholesomeness to community that it's funny, it feels more like Mr. Rogers. It hasn't really existed since, like, and I, I almost missed that, but I got it in Power Pack, and I've read some of the older Fantastic Four, so Power Pack was about the children, oh, remember, it was yeah. like, and they're, like, they were the kids, and they were their parents, and they loved their parents, and they respected them, and it was like, it's very beautiful, and then there were snarks, and these evil lizard demons. But anyway, the, then the X-Men thing kind of took over, yeah. and it was that punk rebellion, nihilism, grr, grr, against uh, all these, like, little factions, and everyone, but we've done that. That's the thing, we've done that now. We've gone through that to the, its very atom. We've kind of gone through every kind of little tribal thing. Um, what do they call it? Um, 
intersectionalism. Intersectionalism. Yeah. Yes, that's kind of broken everything down to the thing where you go, okay, the smallest like minority is the individual. Okay, we've done that bit. That bit is done. So now, mm. zoom, and it's fucking Fantastic Four time. Yeah. And it's the fucking family together, going to fucking Mars, going into fucking space, and fucking defeating Galactus. Yeah. It's amazing, and it's, it's interesting if you think about it, that's why they got it wrong. When they did the Fantastic Four in the past, they were trying to do it in the vernacular of the X-Men. They couldn't commit to the bit. And they, they couldn't there was commit no, to it. There was no context at the time. It yeah. was the wrong time. Yeah, yeah. Because you just can't do Fantastic Four. It's like they couldn't do Superman right. Superman hasn't been done right for a long time. That's right. Superman is far too wholesome. Superman is, is a symbol of everything that humanity could be if we fucking got it together. Yeah. If we really got it together and really fucking believed in each other and we really were the best version of ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, and he was, he got all that from his father, his earth father, Pa Kent, who was just the fucking, just distillation of goodness and like, you know. The past however many years, you couldn't tell that story because no one wanted to fucking hear it. It's like, that was a joke. Yeah. You know, oh fucking, yeah, guy being nice. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but we've done that. We've, we edged ourselves <laughs> until we could edgy no more. And, and, and obviously, I'm going to put this, I'm going to, I'm going to put a, a, a star on this just precisely because it probably calls in the wrong kind of energy, but this in some sense is the Jordan Peterson story, right? <laughs> he is, he, he comes in and he shows up and he shows up as, uh, I mean, I suppose a bit of a, a, a Northern Canadian, a little bit more austere version of a dad who wants you to be better off, mm -hmm. right? But at the end of the day, he is the dad who wants you to be better off. Yeah. And he's here to help you grow up and be a more fully meaningful human. At a point when that had been completely forgotten that that was a thing that anyone was supposed to do at all. Evaporated. At a point when dudes were like hanging out pretending to be 16 in their 40s. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And kids who were in their six, when they were 16 had no idea what it meant to actually interact with a man at all. Yeah. Never um, fucking met one. Never met one. And so that's... It's so funny to see how that archetype is returning, and then, bam, you got your, you got your Fantastic Four. So, um, for those mavens who happen to potentially be in control of this particular piece of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, please, uh, find an artist who in their heart and in their soul deeply grasps the essence of that which is supposed to be expressed through this, and allow this to be the vehicle that it needs to be. Yeah. And then the world will be saved. Then we can... Then then we can save mankind. Then we can move on, right? Yeah. Then we can get on with. Then we can get on with Mars. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah.